back for another casual conversation with the classic today, guys. I got none other than MLW's very own, the IWA World Heavyweight Champion, and the most marketable himself, Richard Holiday. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. I'm I'm thrilled to be on the show with you this evening. I'm thrilled to have you here. Um, it's, it's a long time coming. I've actually been a big fan for a while now. I, I dived into MLW and uh, for a little bit there. The whole Dynasty and Heart Foundation feud was something I was really into at that time. Um, trying to get back into it after the pandemic, but you're the first MLW superstar I get to interview, so that's super cool. Interesting. Well, uh, yeah. I'm a bit. I'm a bit honored. I uh, I do have a question for you though, because I noticed that you said sure. you're a fan. I noticed that you said that you're a fan. Um, so my my question to you would be: Are you a fan, or are you a consumer? Because there's a huge oh. difference. There's a big well, difference. I guess, I guess I'm a consumer. I, I would assume. Correct, right? correct, correct. That would be. Uh, that yeah, would be I took marketing in school term. too. I kind of I know where you're coming from here. <laughs> right, well, listen, I'm a marketing guy, you know, so uh, I think that's the appropriate terminology. But let, let's let's not get too into that. What? Well, I appreciate you because for the listeners, you guys can figure out if you're a fan or a consumer. Think about that for a second there. Um, being the wrestling classic, you know, I'm wearing a Macho Man shirt right now. I like to start with this first and then we'll get into everything you're doing um, because, you know, fans of classic wrestling out here, consumers of classic wrestling out there. Consumers. Uh, <laughs> my first question for you would just be, it's a very basic question, a very podcasty question, but I want to ask it. What were your earliest memories of professional wrestling? Oh, the podcast question. You hit me with it yeah. right off the rip. The podcast right, question. Let's, let's just rip off the Band-Aid. We'll get it out of the way. Um, my earliest memories of, of professional wrestling is going to come uh, around 1997 or so, maybe maybe early 98. Um, I was born in New Haven, Connecticut. There used to be something called the New Haven Coliseum, which is no longer um, up, uh, but it was a pretty big deal. So when WWE would come, uh, they would come, you know, two, three times a year, obviously, because the headquarters is so close. Um, and I remember my father bringing me and my brother and we would go. And, and, and that was my earliest memories. And, you know, this is, uh, you know, like prime attitude era. So, like, you know, the roster, you could tell, you know, the type of, uh, you know, superstars that were there. And, you know, it was amazing. And then just from there, I was hooked. Were there any favorites of yours at that time? Like, who would you say kind of influenced you to want to pursue this? You know, it's crazy is, um, and I actually just posted this picture on Instagram a couple of weeks yeah. ago. My, my childhood idol was Kane. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, absolutely. And if you kind of take a look at my presentation and just what I do in wrestling, it's really not much of a correlation there, right, between Kane and myself. I do do a couple of things in the ring to pay homage to him. But, yeah, he was my absolute favorite. I mean, it was I was enamored by him as a kid. So, um and he was probably my earliest memory as well. So when did you exactly decide you want to pursue professional wrestling? When did this become the thing you wanted to do? Right. So I'm going to give you the the typical stereotypical answer. Yeah. And then I'm going to give and then I'm going to give you the real answer. So, you know, obviously the first time I saw wrestling, I wanted to be a professional wrestler and at 5 years old I decided that this is yeah. my, you know, my livelihood. Um this is how I'm going to pay the bills when I'm older. Uh, is, is doing that. Um, but realistically, um, it was probably around, you know, 22, 21 or 22 years old. I, I remember, you know, my junior, senior year of high school, I kind of faded away from professional wrestling. I didn't even really watch it. And yeah, yeah and, and then I remember I was in training. I played football in college. And during training camp, we had two days, right? We had two day practices. So in the middle of uh, practice one and practice two, I was, I was back in the dorm hanging out and I just went on YouTube and I just went into a rabbit hole of, of what was going on in wrestling at the time. This was around 2011, maybe. Yeah. And, and then I just said, man, this is it. Like football is, is not the life I want to live anymore. Pro wrestling has always been what I loved, you know, for the exception of like two years. I have to do this. Was the transition difficult for you or was it just like you already had that athletic background so wrestling just kind of came to you a little bit quicker? No, I was a natural. Okay. Okay. I love the confidence. I, was a I love the confidence. Yeah. yeah day, day one. I it, actually funny little side story. Uh, and this is true. Um, my trainer, um, I had two trainers. I had Mario Mancini and I had Paul Roma. 
um, Mario was the first person that I ever got into the ring with. And yeah. after our first session, Mario sat me down and he goes, kid, whoever walks through this school is going to hate you. And I said, why? Yeah. And he goes, because you can do it all. And I'm like day one in the ring and I'm like, okay, I can do it all. Like, great. This is, this is amazing. I should be, uh, I should be on national TV in like what, three weeks. Did and that then, prove uh, to be true? Uh, I think it did prove to be true in the sense that, um, yeah, I think I did rub a lot of people the wrong way. Um, yeah. in, in the, in the early stages of, of my career, a hundred percent, I think I did. Um, so yeah, a lot, there was a lot of validity behind it. Okay, okay. Um, MLW. But everybody loves you, everybody loves me now. Everybody loves me now. Everybody, everybody loves you now. And that's what matters. Everybody loves me now. That's what matters. Uh, MLW. How'd you get linked up with MLW and Court Bauer? How did that whole relationship begin? How'd you get signed to MLW? Yeah. So ML. So I'm obviously I'm stationed in Connecticut, and at the time yeah. MLW was just kind of revamping, right? And it was starting back up in Florida. Um, so we had a little communication um in the early stages and then they were like hey instead of you coming down to florida why don't we just make this easy on everybody and we're coming to new york in yeah. july in july of 20 i, uh, I want to say 18 july of 2018 and they were like let's let's bring you in for that it was the battle riot event you know the event with, yeah. with, with, the, with the 40 man rumble so and initially i was just booked for that and yeah. I was cool with it. I was cool with it. You know, I was, I was, uh, you know, only a couple of years in, um, I was, I was looking for a big opportunity and, and I figured this was it. And then I showed up, you know, I was suited up. I looked good. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, that caught their eye and yeah. then they said, Hey, let's, let's give this guy more than the battle riot. So they actually put me in the opening match. Um, I killed it. I think yeah. in October, in October, they came back. To New York, they booked me again. I did great again, um, and then, then I want to say a week after that event, they offered me a contract. Um, That's awesome. And I, yeah, yeah, I had my 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 team look at it, and uh, it made sense. And here I am today. So, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, like I was a big fan of the entire. I was a big consumer of the entire dynasty situation. How did that come together? Um, and, and what brought you guys together? Like, there's a lot of big personalities there. There was you, there was MJF, then there was Hammerstone, there was Ariel Blake for a bit. Like, what brought the group together? Yeah. I, even though the dynasty was a really short lived entity, like in the grand scheme of things, like we had maybe a year run, um, people still talk about it to this day. And I think that we were one of the hottest things in wrestling when that was happening. Uh, just because of the promos that we were putting out, it wasn't even so much what we were doing in the ring. Yeah. You know, and Max, Max and I were the tag team champions. Hammerstone was the national open weight champion. You know, we had all the gold. But it was what we were doing in the promos that was making people really gravitate towards us. And, you know, most people didn't think that it would work, you know, considering the fact that you're, it's three huge type A alpha male personalities no, put the spotlight on me. I don't want to share it with you type guys. But for some odd reason, like we were not oil and water at all. Like we were peanut butter, jelly, and fluff. And we were just killing it. Um, yeah, like you, you would work. think there'd be like a clash of egos or there'd be, but there never was. You guys just all worked really well together. And if, as a, as a consumer watching, I felt like, wow, it seems like these guys have almost like probably been friends forever. Like they just, they seem to understand each other. They got each other's backs. Obviously like there was levels of, you know, um, arrogance sometimes if I can say, but like you guys all understood each other. Right. Yeah. It was, it was, it was very cohesive. Um, and it was a ton of fun, honestly. I mean, it was, it was really a moment in time. I think the dynasty will live forever. And you guys all kind of had a little bit of a business mindset. Like you knew what you guys were trying to do, and that was make the most money and be the most dominant group in MLW. And I think that kind of helped the situation too, would you say? Well, there was a lot going on. There's always a lot going on at MLW, but specifically at that time, there was a lot of guys in the locker room who wanted to yeah. make sure that they catapulted the brand to the next level and that they were the faces of it. And every time we were just like, no, it's us. Like no doubt about it. This is our time. You guys can move over. You know, try and follow our matches, try and follow our promos. You're not going to be able to do it. And that was our mindset. And, you know, if I'm being honest and maybe slightly biased, uh, it kind of worked. No, 100%.
Um, you 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 are entitled. The nickname is the most marketable. What makes you the most marketable? Where did this come from? Well, the, the I mean, well, I really have a degree in marketing. Um, that's, okay, that's a that's a very real thing. Um, I'm highly educated in the field of marketing, and you know, in the grassroots of professional wrestling, it's really all it is. is marketing is who are you presented to the consumers? Why are you um, somebody that the consumers are going to gravitate towards? And then for me, I mean, I just think it was. Um, it just coincided so well, you know, do I have to give you a specific reason as to why I'm the most marketable? I don't think I do, but I just think that in terms of the physical standpoint, the articulation standpoint, the educational standpoint, the business standpoint, um, I just think I check all of the boxes. Well, I shouldn't say think, I know I do, you know, I check all the boxes that you need to be successful. And again, with the knowledge of marketing, just kind of made sense. You got, you got the background there. You mentioned earlier that you kind of you remember seeing wrestling in that 1997 era. You were watching what was going on. You were going to the shows when they'd come there. Back in those days, specifically, there was a man named Salvio Vega who was a part of the Nation of Domination doing his thing. How does it feel for you now that you've got to work with him in town? And not only that, you beat him for a championship and then beat him again. Yeah, I've kind of owned Savio. Um, the past <laughs> couple of years, if I'm being frank, you know, yeah. and then, you know, I, I won the IWA Caribbean championship and then, you know, he runs IWA Puerto Rico and I went there and yeah. won the heavyweight championship too. So I think Savio just got to the point where he was like, you know what? Um, I'm the old bull. This is the young steed. You know, this, this kid is the stud. Um, let me step aside and let me just appreciate what Richard is at this point. Um, and I'm a huge, I'm a huge ambassador for Puerto Rico and the consumer Ninos down there. Um, you know, they love me. They, yeah. they greet me with open arms. Yeah. It's like, it's like a, it's like Mardi Gras when I, when I get off the plane in Puerto Rico, you know, it's like these consumers are just uh, waiting outside for me, you know, with their little air horns, you know, um, you know, when I'm talking on the microphone, Um, To them, I speak Spanish um, because I'm educated and I'm able to do that. Um, You know, hablo espanol. It's it's really it's really quite a thing. You know, yeah, I'm a huge ambassador. You're making sure to you cater towards that target audience. You know, being the most marketable, you're making sure you cater to that target audience. You know what they want to see, what they like. Of course, you have to be able to speak to the consumer needios, you know. So yo soy el campeón, you know. I am the champion. Oh, wow. oh there yeah. you go. And you're not the only the champion there. You, you as the most marketable. You've been winning belts around all around uh, the U.S. and Puerto Rico and all these places. You, uh, I think I heard earlier that you won the belt at Big Time Wrestling recently as well. Yeah, the Big Time Wrestling Heavyweight Champion, uh, which is a, a really big promotion based out of the Northeast. Actually, not even so much the Northeast. You know, we uh, we just did a quick little loop. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, where we were in some some really run down town in, in Pennsylvania, uh, about an hour and a half uh, east of Pittsburgh. I do not remember the name. Um, and then we were in Long Island, New York, which is, you know, obviously great. Um, but we did the back to back nights. And then on night two, I, I was able to capture the heavyweight championship. And now I'm the flag bearer for the brand. And, uh, you know, the, the, the pandemic obviously shut them down for a little bit, but they're coming back super strong. And um, you know, from a marketing standpoint, I think they're hitting the ground running with me as champion. So, you know, if you're you a consumer and, you, and, and, and you've never checked out Big Time Wrestling, I highly suggest that you do. There's merit behind the name. Look at that. You're, you're so marketable. You're winning championships in other places people want to bring you in. You brought up the pandemic really briefly, though. How do you keep yourself the most marketable during the pandemic? How, how, how do you deal with that? Well, I think it was a, it was a great time to engage on social media. Um, it was a time to... Um, you know, engage w- with the, with your consumer base, and you know, just check in and 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 stay as relevant as you could. I know MLW did something called um, uh, Pulp Fusion, um, yeah, which was a way, which was a yeah, which was great. It was a ton of fun. It was a way for the roster to stay relevant with the consumers and and put something out there uh, on a weekly basis. So you know, obviously, the pandemic was a very dark, weird time. Honestly, I hate talking about it. Um, thank God we are uh, quote unquote you know out of it. Um, yeah, yeah, I use those quotes because, uh, we're, obviously we're not so sure what, what's going on, uh, currently. Um, 
but we're not uh, locked in our houses, right? So um, that's a plus. No, 100%. And it must have been great to get back in front of fans again, to be able to to hear from the consumers, to see what they like and what they dislike. It's, it's, it's a different vibe, of course. Um, and like I said before, like, you know, clearly you're, there's merit behind the name because now you're working in the places. Uh, I heard you're going to be down here near my neck of the woods. I'm out here in Vancouver. Seattle's very close. You, you, you come through Defy a few times as well. Yeah, I was able to do a quick, uh, quick little loop out in Seattle, which has my heart. I absolutely yeah. love Seattle. Um, you know, just the coffee out there was just sensational. Just some <laughs> of the best coffee shops I've ever been to in, in my life and probably will ever go to in my life. Um, I mean, it's like the coffee capital of the world for anybody who knows me. That was like, you know, I was I was geeked out on caffeine out there I'll tell you <laughs> that much. Uh, but dude, Defy Wrestling and Without a Cause Wrestling, two fantastic uh, just world class promotions um, that I am I am eager to go back to, um, partially because I want to do another coffee tour, um, but also because you know it's a great wrestling market. It's a really strong market out there. And even going further down south, you'll be showing up as well at uh, PCW Alter, correct? Have you gone oh, yeah. there yet? I have not been there. So on January twenty eighth, that's going to be my debut um, in Los Angeles. It, uh, that's really gonna, PCW. That's really gonna put the pressure on you because if there's a lot of consumerism, it's down there in California. You know what I mean? Like that's like the hub of California, and New York. Those are the two sides where you know they're pushing out all that marketing on people. Well, listen, if there's one thing I love, it's the bright lights. Um, I love performing in the big time cities. You know, Philadelphia, Dallas, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles yeah. will be just like those, uh, and those consumers are gonna see what it's like to breathe in rarefied air. You know, it's different. It's a different feeling when I enter the room. It's a different feeling when I get into the ring. Um, and I'm excited for it. I think that they're obviously very excited when I got announced. Yeah. Let me ask you this then. Let me put you on the spot for a second here. As the marketing mind that you have, what the marketing mind that you have, if you can name any superstar that could really use some help in that aspect of marketing themselves, who would you say would really need that? Well, I would say Gino Medina without a doubt. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, I put him in the dynasty. I thought that he was, uh, I thought that he was the most marketable Latino. If yeah. I'm being honest. Yeah. I was trying to, I was trying to gauge the, the Latino market and who knew all along that it was me who was the yeah. most marketable in the Latino market. Look what I've done. You know, I've, I wrestled in, in, in Mexico in Tijuana. Um, yeah. and I just, I just got back from Tijuana. Um, and then I go to Puerto Rico, I'm all over in these Latin markets, but, uh, you know, I tried to give Gino the rub, you know, the marketing rub. Um, he's such a tremendous in-ring talent and I, I, yeah. I still believe that he is. Um, but if I had to, uh, yeah, see, d don't you love that? I'm not one of those corny people who like kind of dodges the answer and is like, I don't really want to think of anybody. Like I can give you, I'll give you a straight up answer. Yeah, you know? no, I really do appreciate that. I didn't know where you, I, I thought I put you on the spot. Be like, no, I, I got the answer for no. you right here. No, there's no, there's no put me on the spot. I'll give you an answer right up front. Um, and Gino, if you're <laughs> listening, just remember, I did fire you from the dynasty. Oh, well. Is there anyone else you'd want to take under your wing? Do you see potential in anybody else? Uh, no, I don't. And that's not because there's not people out there who have potential. Of course there are. Um, do I want to take them under my wing? That was the keen part that I, I, I really dialed in on that question. No, I don't. Um, I'm not really interested in mentoring anybody at the moment. I know who the champion is, but is it, has it crossed your mind at all to go after the MLW world title? I mean, you're winning world titles everywhere else. Well, I mean, I'm sure it's crossed yeah. your mind, but is there any ambition towards it at this very moment? Listen, do I think that I would look great with the MLW world championship? Yeah, I do. Do I think that MLW would benefit with having me as a champion? Part of me, yeah. Is Hammerstone still my best friend? Yes, he is. Uh, and he is the world heavyweight champion at the moment. Um, Cesar Duran, um, for anybody who is following, did uh, promise me a world title match. You know, I didn't really, uh, I didn't really uh, pay too much attention to that. But um, I guess I do have a winning lottery ticket if I did want to cash it in. I don't know. Um, but for the most part, you know, I, uh, I'm doing other things in MLW that are fun and amazing. So. 
No, oh, fair enough. I just thought I'd ask. I know another relationship with you and Hammerstone. I was curious. I'm like, what if, what if, like, what if there was some circumstances where you had to cross paths? Well, you know, you know what's happened? funny is, is if you ask Hammerstone, he'll say he wants the match. Okay. He wants the match with me. And, uh, you know, I just, I, 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 I see that and I hear that. Um, and I don't really respond to it. I don't. I don't mean to be disrespectful. But you're not like dodging it for any reason. It's just more of a. You just don't want to go there, or. I just think it's too fresh. Okay, you want the people to wait. You want the people to want it. You want the consumers' anticipation if it happens, but you're not going to force it on anybody. Yeah, I don't force anything. I don't force ah, anything. Fair enough. Yeah, that's nothing to do with marketing there. Um, Future goals. What 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 do you have? Like you've already you're achieving so much. You're doing so much already. Like what's what's next for you? What do people have to look forward to when it comes to Richard Holiday? You know, I just think it's it's when it comes to marketing and when it comes to branding, it's just constant evolution, constant um, expansion. Um, you know, I do have some short term goals, um, but for the long term, it's just to be um, right now. It's to be the most anonymous name with Major League Wrestling. But outside of that, it's it's to continue to do what I'm doing, popping up in Seattle, popping up in Los Angeles, going to Texas, going to Puerto Rico, Mexico, all these amazing places. I do have a goal to to go to the United Kingdom. That's a huge goal of mine. Um, yeah. You know, maybe, maybe go uh, live over there and and check out the uh, the tea shops over there. I wouldn't order any tea because um, tea drinkers are weird. <laughs> but I would get the coffee over there. You know, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's good. Um, so that's a goal of mine for sure. And it's just, like I said, just continuous improvement. That's how I've always looked at the business. You know, it's just, how can I get better than last week? How can I get better than last year or last month? How can I get better than yesterday? And that's just how I've always approached it. No, that's fair. That's that's, that's the way I think people should approach it, right? Um, trying to be better than the day before. Trying to work towards being a better person. Um, this was a great conversation. I really appreciate you coming on. Is there anything you want to add before we wrap things up? Do you want to let people know um, they can find you? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do my shameless plugs right now. Yeah. Um, you can find me on Twitter and on Instagram. It's the same handle. It's at most marketable. Um, actually, on both my Twitter and Instagram, I have my link tree where you can click that. Uh, and then you can find my Pro Wrestling Tea Store where I have new designs up right now. You could find my signature coffee blend, Rarified Air. Um, I partnered with Legal Speed Coffee Company based out of Los Angeles. They will actually be at the PCW okay. show, which I'm pretty stoked about. And um, they can purchase my coffee because it's really fantastic. Um, I mean, I'm drinking it at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Maybe at this point, what time is it? Like 8.30 or something? It is. Is it ever too late to have a cup of coffee? How, how would you describe your coffee? Because I'm a big coffee drinker, and I do really enjoy coffee. Right. So it has notes of um, – it's Guad Guatemalan descent. Um, it has notes of coffee um, and citrus, and it's it's yeah. really a love. It's a lovely blend. It really is. I always tell people that it's more of a. Uh, it's like a coffee drinker's coffee, right? Like As if, if you go ahead, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. If you okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's a coffee drinker's coffee. You know, it's it's, it's if you enjoy like a good roast, you know, you're gonna enjoy it. If you're a you know. A Folgers in the morning, just grab and go. You know, I'll go to Cumberland Farms for a dollar coffee. I don't know; it might not be worth your time. Um, but you know, I'm I'm catering to a specific demographic. I'm catering to coffee lovers because uh, that's what I am. No, fair enough. I, I definitely want to try it out. It sounds like something I would enjoy as well um, as a consumer. Um, you also mentioned your store with the t-shirts. How look? Do you come up with your own designs, or is this like a group effort? Like, how do you come up with the designs for your shirts and stuff too? All just des- all des- I, I I work. Um, I do work with a with a graphic designer um, at Eighth Wonder Nick. I believe is his is his handle on on uh, yeah. Twitter. He's awesome. He's awesome. He does great work. Uh, but all the ideas are are me. It's all in my head, and then I put it out there. I just, I just wanted people to know, as, as the marketing genius that you are, as the most marketable one, Richard Holiday, I thought the people should know that all these designs, the coffee, they all come from your brain. You're the guy behind it. There's truth behind the name. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> it was a pleasure talking to you. I want to have you back on here for sure. Um, this is the first time we got to chat. I'm gonna, I want to come back to this uh, sometime down the road and continue the conversation. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Um, I feel like I learned a lot from you today. Uh, and uh, I hope you, I uh, hope uh, maybe we can 
now that this whole pandemic stuff's calmed down, I can come to an MLW show and I can see Richard Holiday in action in person. That would be awesome, man. That would be awesome. Maybe, maybe I can get you uh, free tickets. Who knows? Oh, I wow. I have, I, I think look I look how much you care about the consumers. You're all about the consumers all the time. Hey, you man. Really I, that. I, I think I have a little pull at MLW. I might be able to swing that, you know? So oh, wow. uh, we'll, we'll see. I really do appreciate it. If there's anything you want to let the people know, if you had one one thing you want to let the people know, what would you want to tell them? I would tell them that for the consumers that listened to this interview from start to finish um, and were wildly entertained, and I know that you were, you are officially breathing rarefied air. And there you go. There's no better way to end it than with that. So there we go, guys. We'll see you all next time. And uh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Dig it. Uh huh. It's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.